Survivor Specialist Alexa and Phil are back with a very special guest today. We are joined by Wendell Holland of Survivor Ghost Island and Survivor Winners at War fame, uh, donning a Colin Kaepernick jersey. Looking great. Um, obviously a pretty wild week. So, um, you know, we're, we're going to be talking about Survivor and we're going to be talking about Wendell's experience, but I think a lot of this ties in. So we're happy to have you, Wendell. We're happy to talk to you and uh, really looking forward to looking forward to chatting. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you guys. I love your, your podcast. Um, you guys know that. Phil's all right. Alexa, you're amazing. So it's good. <laughs> Well, there was a reason why Alexa introduced you. I mean, it, it felt awkward. It probably sounded weird to the viewers, but there was no way I was going to sit here and introduce you, Wendell. No way. There's just no way that's happening. After after what you did on this season, you evil, oh evil God. man. Yeah, how could you? How, how could you? I, I don't know what. Try to win a challenge and ask for Jeff's, Jeff to check you out? I, I don't know. I don't I don't see what the problem was there. That's crazy, yeah. I, I can't believe I, I told Jeff to, to watch as we almost finished the challenge. <laughs> yes, Dave, but you know. It's yeah, cool. after you've gone through that before. Last is your first season. Yeah, um, yeah. That's I. I don't want to sit here and complain about my edit, but tr that's that's like the story that I was given this season. So I guess we could kind of start with that. Um, I didn't think I would have such an edit, and if you look at remember before the season, they flew out like seven castaways to to do the pre screening and whatnot. I was one of those people, and I'm like, okay. I don't know why I'm one of these people. I didn't, I obviously didn't win the season. I did think I gave them good content for the season, but I don't think it was really shown. And, mm -hmm. um, and they, they kind of made me the villain and it hurt because if you actually look at those interviews from, you know, the day before or a couple days before the show premiered, I was so happy and I was like, so ready for this season and everything. And then every week it was like, I, my happiness was just like, ah, 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 ah. And then, you know, obviously I was, I was booted and a lot wasn't shown, but I, you, you got to take all that in stride. I signed up for a reality television show. So it's a television show and they can, they have the ability to portray me however they want. So I know who I am. So I'm good it with it. What was that? What was that like, though? Because on your first season, Dom was the one who took a lot of the heat. Dom was the one who yelled at uh, Sebastian and, and really got in people's faces and was loud. And you were the nice guy. You were quiet. You were nicer. Like, that's what what was it like to kind of see this full 180? And all of a sudden now you're I mean, people hated you. It was crazy. They hated me. They really did. Fortunately, the tide has kind of turned and um, thank thankful for people that actually know me, like, you know, coming to my defense. And even the fans that have said, I met Wendell one time and I know the kind of person he is, or I've seen him on social media for the last two years and he's remained the consistent person. So it was good to have people come to my defense, but for me to kind of be crucified, it, it was tough because it started off with like me voting, us voting out par. And so first it was like a perfect storm against me because first you have this um, amazing, Rushmore type person in the survivor community that you're voting out and her following. I knew she had a following, but she has a following and they're crazy. <laughs> so uh, voting out par started it. It allowed people to like, you know, come at me for whatever reason, um, just because they hate Barb or whatever. And because the show showed a couple short interactions of me being short and quick or trying not to, like, if I'm short and quick with Nick and Yule, that's because clearly we came from to call 1.0 and we have an alliance. This is how I communicate in Survivor, like with me and Dom. Yo, Dom, tonight we're going out such and such. Boom, all right, go. Done. It's not, it's not like, Dom, tonight. No, it's, it's me being quick and direct because that's how I thought that was an effective way to communicate in a show like Survivor where people are looking for reasons to associate you with other people and where you don't want to have long conversations with people if you don't have to. So I think I, I was shown saying something like that to Nick and you, like, all right, you're voting here, you're voting here, cool. But no, the way that it looks is me speaking at people. And then my interactions with um, Phil's lady, Michelle, uh, it, it showed, I think it was kind of like, I think it was kind of one-sided. I think they showed a couple of shorter interactions or they, allowed the story that they told was when I got on the beach B 
because Wendell's a jerk or because Wendell wronged her or whatever. Um, that's why I, I didn't want to have a conversation as soon as we got on the beach together. When in essence, um, I was elated when I knew that we were going to be on the same tribe, to get, tribe together because she was my number one going in the game, despite me now learning that I was not her, her number one. She was my number one going into the game, so I was happy. And like literally the boat ride to the um, to the island from that the sa- sand spit where we were um, swapped on, the boat ride over there, I was like smiling. I was just super happy to be um, on a tribe with my ally, but also my real friend. Mm. Or what I now I don't even know what we are, but who who I thought was a, a true friend of mine, because um, yeah, we dated during Ghost Island while Ghost Island aired, but after that, my every interaction with her, my every every time I spoke to her, or whatever, it was all love and friendship. So I was just happy to be. That's like me being on the island with with Dom. I, you know, it's like me being on the island with someone that I'm close with. Um, I know her family. I know. Uh, you know, I know things about her and she, so I was excited, but then for them to make it look that way, I was just like, man, that's, uh, that's, they did me dirty. Mm -hmm. I think what ultimately ended up hurting you and, and cause now, I mean, you are, you know, you said my lady here and you come at, you come at Michelle on this, on this season. So brutally Wendell, but, but I think what actually did end up hurting you is the fact that she goes to final three and you get voted out earlier. So it was easy to make her look like she's overcoming something. Yeah. And on a season where we've seen all of you win, we kind of know who you all are. They have to try to paint somebody as a villain. And I think you unfortunately just fell into the, you're going to be the villain of Michelle's story. Yeah. So I think there's a quote, something to the tune of like history is written by the victors or those that win. And in this case, of course she made it further than me, but, um, and she she gave them enough material to make me not look so great. So um, it's I don't think I don't think she was actively trying to harm me or anything like that. I think going into the game, and this is what I truly believe, though we don't talk as often anymore. Um, I think going into the game, she was just like, "All right, I'm, we're distancing ourselves." Those were the conversations we had before the game started. Like, "Yo, you know, say what you want. I'm say what I want." But then when we get together, let's let's do our thing. And so, again, it's a perfect storm. You have this person who ultimately gets to the end of the game. She did what she had to do to make it to the end. And you have her on an island with someone who she has history with. And for strategy purposes, she is telling people whatever about me. And then ultimately, I'm the merge boot. So... From a production standpoint, I feel like it's a layup. We can make this guy who voted out, who was part of the vote outs of Tyson, Yule, Parv, we can make him a villain. They continue to go to tribal throughout this um, this third of the game or this fourth of the game. So why not make, and it, to me, it seemed like easy votes. You get out Parv because she's one of the greatest of all time and one of the executive producers, like all time thing. <laughs> You get her out of there. You get out Yule because the man is brilliant. Um, You get out Tyson because of who Tyson is. He makes everyone laugh. Tyson is the guy, like, if he's sitting at final tribal, he'll probably have the jury laughing. And Tony actually had us cracking up telling us some of his antics at final tribal. And that softens someone up or that just makes you, uh, you know, it makes you, I don't know, it does something. So humor does a lot out there. I would see Tyson saying things to us and the whole crew, the camera crew, and everyone's laughing. They're cracking up. And I'm like, you know what? Everyone loves this guy. So, yeah, he's somebody we need off the island. So there are legitimate reasons to get rid of these tremendous players and to keep around players that aren't necessarily those players. So, and I think that's that also speaks to why I pre-gamed with Michelle and Nick. We're similarly situated. Let's get to the end together so it's not some kind of uh, – us and Tony or us and Kim or us and Boston Rob or us and Park. If it's like that, then clearly, you know, it, it, you don't even, you don't even need to look at someone's gameplay. If I'm sitting next to Parv at the end, she's getting all the votes. 
uh, I don't know. I've been rambling and going on. <laughs> but, but, but that's good. And you hit the nail on the head. It's not like you got rid of Tyson, Yule, and Parvati. You did that with a group of people. The whole point is that you need a group of people to do this. So the bullshit that was just aimed at you all, all season. And I mean, I, I think I, I love what you did that you, you went out of your way to call people out. You had no problem showing people some of them, showing the internet, some of the messages that you were getting. And it was, it was racist. It was ridiculous. And it was, it was horrible. And I, 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 I understand like, like what you said that, oh, they had to make a villain, but that's, that's not what that was. And that's, that's what, that's what was so frustrating a, from from my perspective so for you i can't even imagine what that must have been like yeah it was it was it was hard it was it was very hard um let's see Let, where do i start i think okay here's where, where i'll start i'll start back on the island there was a point when par continued to call me aggressive and i will admit in a challenge i will be the most aggressive person um aggressively trying to win a challenge for sure um I'm not aggressive when I speak to women. I'm not aggressive in my interactions with my friends. And I am a pacifist. And this might show how close I was to Michelle. There was a point that like me and Michelle went in the water and we were just, you know, hanging out, chatting it up. And I said, Michelle, hey, please be mindful and be careful of this aggressive narrative that Parv is pushing because a white woman calling a black man aggressive on national TV, it's not a great narrative, but also, especially when that's not the person that I am. Um, you're not even calling me what I am. And looking at the edit, I'm like this angry black guy or, or this confident or this cocky or this arrogant person. And I am absolutely confident in my abilities. I love competing. I've I was the captain of the football, basketball, and track team in height. Like, I, I compete. That's what I do. On the football field, people talk trash. That's what they do. On the basketball court, that's what they do. When I'm in Survivor and I'm like, yo, Jeff, keep an eye on your boy. Yo, we're about to – that's not even me. That's not even me scratching the surface mm -hmm. of talking trash. Playing a game. Yeah. yeah. That's and, and I've heard on podcasts, like, I think I heard Fishback one time say, hey, it's good strategy to keep keep calling Jeff over. That's strategy. That's not me being a jerk. And for um, for it to be portrayed that way, it was kind of it was it, it was hurtful to me. But I just decided because I signed up for this, because I'm now like a public figure or whatever, I'm in the public's eye. Um, you gotta take your you gotta take your shots. There are gonna be people that um, want to say whatever about you and that don't love you. But I've also realized through conversations with many people. Um, even Tyson, Bryce, uh, a lot of people there, they just tell me how much of a vocal minority it truly is. Mm -hmm. it's, it's people with these stand accounts that have like 25 accounts that want to spam you. Uh, but then there are some legitimate people that say some nasty things. One guy, I felt a need to post it the other day, uh, because it was out of the blue. Um, well after the season, he, he called me ghetto trash and I posted that. And, um, if no one knows what calling a black person ghetto trash means to a black person, we take it as, as something else. And it's not ghetto trash. That's not how we think that you're calling us. So him calling me that, I was like, you know what? I'm going to post it. And usually when I get hate, I post it, I blur out people's names. I do all that just so people know like, look, hey, it's still coming. I'm not going to respond to it. I might give them like hearts or kissy faces or something because mm -hmm. Um, you know, it could go one of two ways. Like I could, I could start a fight with someone and say, Hey, come, come pull up. But that's, that's not even, that's not even me. And that's not the image that I want to uh, portray. And especially in light of them making me look like this aggressive, whatever person, if I tell someone to come pull up and then, you know, whatever can happen. So yeah, it's, um, it's, I, I do, I, I get hate. Um, but then I also, and on Survivor, I never wanted to be political or talk political things because that's not a winning sur Survivor strategy. But then, like, I think of the, the, the backlash, and then I think of President Obama. And I think, what how would he react to any of these things, especially when he was in office? He can't react to these things. He can't react to trolls or whatever because 
then he's almost proving them right or something. So I just try to carry myself where when the hate comes, I feel it. I absolutely feel it. It affects me. I've cried at night. I've like cried in the shower. It affects me. But I understand that there are people that look up to me. I have fans. I have high school students. So many of them. I get so many messages just saying like, Wendell, you're the reason why I'm applying. You are. I, I didn't watch the show until um, until like I saw you on the screen. And now I love the show. I'm trying to continue to bring Survivor to audiences that don't necessarily always watch Survivor. I'm trying to be a good ambassador. And the way the best way to do that is not is not by, you know, fighting people online or anything like that. And I think I think the biggest problem right now is most people our age, because I'm not that much younger than you are, but most people our age, we were taught like, turn the other cheek, turn the other cheek, turn the other cheek. And that's easy to do in person. I really believe that. I mean, I was a huge hothead when I was growing up, but I think that's an easier thing to do in person. And then when it gets online, we try to keep that same mentality, turn the other cheek, turn the other cheek, turn the, but we've been turning the other cheek for so many years now that it's gotten out of hand. And now there's just non-stop because now like it's become so much and like you said you're getting 25 accounts that are just spamming you because you're turning the other cheek i personally and i saw adam do this after his season and, and you know with his with his mother um i think that sometimes the best way to get through to people like this and to get them to stop is to start doing kind of what you do where it's like repost it and be like this is what's happening and this can't keep happening like you like it's, it was easy at first. I feel like, like when, you know, social media first started coming out to kind of just like ignore things, turn the other cheek. This is a vocal minority, whatever. But now it's gotten to a point where it's just gotten out of hand and there needs to be some way to stop it and maybe taking the opposite approach because, you know, not, not trying to fight somebody and say, come, you know, come over here and fight, but like just, you know, putting it out there that this is happening and how awful it is. Cause people think they can get away with just anything. It's, it's insane. Yeah, I. One way to to silence your haters is to never to not even look in their direction and to not say anything to them. And I've I've done a lot of that and I've tried that, but there are some times when I just feel the need to like repost something and then let the world. Sometimes the world takes care of it. Like uh, for example, I I posted that guy that called me ghetto trash, and. Um, like, I think it was Figgy who either texted me or called me and she was like, yo, I took care of business for you. I DM'd him. I let him know what's up. And I don't ask for that. I'm not asking anyone to do that or act on my behalf. But sometimes in just putting it out and then his, his account, I think he then made it private or whatever he did. But sometimes if you put it out there, then the world, um, the, there are ways that, you know, things happen. I mean, I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not saying, Hey, I'm not calling the homies up until sending them to, to him or anything like that. But, um, yeah, I, I just, there are some times that I feel a need to, cause, cause then you can, you can show the world that it exists. If you post it, these are, these are DMS in my like private, like in the private section of my DMS, it's not even my real DMS. And if I look in there and see some hate, then yeah, I'll, I'll screenshot it and maybe I'll post it just so people can see that it exists. And, and I, th yeah. I think you're completely right there. I think so many people either turn the other cheek or just they, they, they think and they're like, how, how could anybody possibly actually think that? How, how could anybody actually say that to someone? So I think you putting it out there and, and not blurring names and showing that there's a real life person and people who say shit like that, I think, I think that's the right thing to do. I think calling them out and showing that this is real is the way to fix it. Yeah. That, I mean, yeah, that's, that's, it's, it's one approach. Um, yeah. and it's crazy. It's crazy. Cause right now people are on edge and you know, we're in the middle of this pandemic and there are people with a lot of time on their hands. And so, like I said, people are on edge, like for whatever reason, you might be a little short or you might be a little tempered for whatever reason, maybe because we're cooped up in the house and we can't see our friends like we want to. I can't play basketball. All the courts are either taken down or boarded up or something like that. So I get it. I understand. I understand people's frustrations. 
And then fast forward to like the last few weeks with the, the murders of um, Ahmaud Arbery and George Floyd. And um, I don't know, I think, I think it's gotten to like a, a bubbling point and things are bubbling over right now. We're seeing, we're seeing unrest. Um, I don't even like using the term riots. We're seeing unrest. We're seeing what happens when you, you, you kneel, you peacefully protest, and you don't see anything. Or once you speak up, I saw it, someone said it on, on CNN the other day. It was like, when you speak and no one hears you, then you yell. When you yell and no one hears you, then you throw something. When you throw something and no one hears you or no one acts or no one does anything, then thing like it's not like people are just burning the place down because they didn't try other means so and again i'm a pacifist and i don't believe in violence but at this point i'm almost um like right now in philadelphia it's it's 125 at, at 12 o'clock there was a protest our first protest in city hall um in light of the events that have happened and um, I had friends calling me like, yo, are you coming out here? Are you coming out here? And I'm here with you guys because using my voice on this platform will help and it will get out there. But I can't say I won't go down to City Hall and, and be out there protesting after this. And, um, and I, can't say, I can't say people are in the wrong for burning plate. I can't, I can't say people are in the wrong for this happening. But what I can say is the people that are adamant, adamantly against uprisings and rioting and whatnot, and people are so mad at a target being burnt down and whatnot, if they're not mad at a man being killed and kneeled on for nine minutes, if they're not mad at the, the system that brought about this reaction or this response, then they have their priorities wrong because mm -hmm. something made this happen. It wasn't just all of a sudden America just jumped up and said, you know what, let's burn down Target and 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 restaurants and, and local, you know, businesses. It's, hey, I've been trying to get your attention. I, I've been trying my best. I've been seeing people that look like me murdered for any type of reason. I've seen, um, there was a video, I forget the child's name. He was 12 years old and he had like um, uh, a pellet gun maybe but the cops within seconds pulled up and, and killed him. Um, we've seen black people getting killed over selling loose cigarettes. That's, uh, yes. And then, and then we see people assassinating the character of the person that was killed. And if you ask me, no matter, no matter what they did, there's no excuse for that person being killed right then and there for whatever, whether it's, whether someone stole something from a 7-Eleven, whether I talk back to a police officer, um, there's no excuse for you to, you, you to kill me in that situation. Further, if from my perspective, I've been pulled over so many times. I grew up in a, a great neighborhood outside of Philadelphia, and I've been pulled over so many times in that neighborhood for whatever reason. I have a list of reasons. I thought about tweeting every single night a different reason why I got pulled over. And then I'm just like, you know what? I will retweet things, I will tweet things, but I, I also have to take care of my mental health and I have to recharge myself. So me and Bryce are going out and doing like a picnic tomorrow at the water. Like, there, are things that, there are things that I need to do, you know, to, to, to charge myself back up so I can continue speaking about terrible things. Um, but geez, what was I about to say? Um, I don't know. I, there's just you, there's so much. There's so I could speak to you guys uninterrupted for all day about this stuff and about my experiences and about things that I, I'd love to see change. Um, and I, I I don't even consider myself the most or or nearly the most well versed on this stuff. I'm just literally speaking from my experience, what I've seen through my standpoint. Uh, but it's it's not great. Oh, I know what I was gonna say. I'm sorry. No, 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 keep going. This is what we want to hear. Um, from, from my perspective, I, I understand the importance of service people and police officers and all those things. But if growing up, all you see is 
the bad side and um like if all you see is is one what i don't I, I have no positive interactions with police officers can't say i have none because i i me and sarah lacina have had great experiences on the island and we've um broken through boundaries with one another and stuff so and i could speak about that but from my perspective, a police officer is supposed to be a guardian of society and a de-escalator and someone that, a protector, someone that walks into a situation that might be, um, might be heated or elevated in some right and they should kind of de-escalate what's going on. When police officers pull over a black man, we fear for our lives to the point where um, Oftentimes, if I get pulled over, which happens more often than not, especially because I drive around a lot and I t take road trips to do deliveries and stuff, I will put down all my windows, I will take the keys out of the car, put them on the dash, and put my hands on the wheel. Because I'm fearful that I will get shot by a police officer during a routine traffic stop. Um, I remember in high school, as high schoolers, me and my friends would drive up to Penn State and for like uh, our, our buddies were going to summer study up there. So during our summers on the weekends, we drive up there. One time, these three black kids, man, we were like 16, 17 years old. The police officer that pulled us over had his gun out in his hands. Like that's petrifying. What does that do to a 16 year old? I mean, that's difficult. So I was trying to say, Police officers should be de-escalators. So they should know, especially when pulling over like a black man, like this man might feel some type of way about me. So let me make it a point to, to be, to, to not aggravate the situation. I'm a de-escalator. I should walk up to the window. He might be yelling at me and this, that, and the third, but as a police officer, you should find a way to de-escalate the situation. I saw... The, um, the police chief in Atlanta during the riots, I saw a clip of her and I want to tip my hat to her. I don't know, I don't. she's a white lady, um, a middle-aged white lady, if I'm not mistaken. Um, she was out there in the streets speaking to the protesters and hearing them and they were upset and rightfully upset, just as I am rightfully upset and as the nation should be. And they were, they were raising their voice at her and speaking and voicing their concerns but she was hearing them and you could see in her face that she's hearing them. And her response was one of someone that actually listens. And it's a police chief leaving her office, coming down in the streets to interact with her, with the constituents because she, she can understand the importance of that. And if they can, if there's a dialogue and if they can then communicate and if people listen, then things can happen and change can happen. She was, hearing them out because they were saying that officers were not responding to their protests appropriately down there. And if you look at many videos, last night I saw a video in New York of an officer, many officers walking down the street, a lady who's probably in her twenties and weighs maybe like a buck 20 is in front of the officer. He pushes her like as hard, hard like like a football lineman would do she falls on the ground hits her head and then i saw a video of her in the hospital speaking out and saying that no she didn't spit in the officer's face or say whatever to them officers should be de-escalators they shouldn't be someone that automatically wants to jump down your throat and that's my experience with them and i'm not saying that all officers are like that but i'm saying that if you have five bad officers and a hundred good officers and the five bad officers are doing something and the hundred good officers don't say anything about that. Then you have 105 bad officers. If you ask me, because if, if you don't say something, if you don't speak up, your silence is, it's like a stamp of approval. All right, I'm gonna chill. I'm gonna drink my coffee. This is coffee, no. it's not beer. Um, you're getting one sip. Of coffee. <laughs> it looks back into it. It looks I, like a like I the Coors banquet bottles. You know what I'm talking about? The Coors banquet bottles, the little yeah. ones. That's what it yeah. looks like. Wouldn't judge you, viewer. <laughs> <laughs> <Let's be clear. laughs>
<laughs> Trader Joe's organic brewed coffee. So w yeah. Wendell drinks the best coffee out there. No, and and my question to you, because because you know, hearing all this, but you know, kind of bringing it back to Survivor a little bit, like when you're talking with somebody like Sarah, you start off on the same tribe as Sarah. Um, I, I don't, I don't know if you had talked to her before the game or anything like that, but Sarah, who we had on this podcast, you know, a week and a half ago or so, she seems to be somebody like every time she ends up on survivor, she always ends up like in these really big conversations. And, and we see that like, can you maybe like, like talk a little bit about what it was like being on the tribe with Sarah and how, if that changed your opinion or didn't change it or just anything in general? For sure. For sure. I went out on the, I saw Sarah in game changers. I heard stories about Sarah. Um, people said things that she did or did not do after she won, and people speak about her political affiliations and all that stuff. And like I said before, I don't go out on Survivor to to speak political views or racial views or anything like that. I go out there to try to win. And understanding I'm going into season 40 and all winter season, I think Bryce might have uh, sent a text or two in be between Sarah and I just to open the lines of communication. Um, so at the very least, we might have texted something like, hey, see you out there or whatever it was. There was some small dialogue. And so I get on the call and I obviously I build a lot of stuff and I didn't want to do all that, but we build this beautiful shelter and Tony's right there with me the whole time building with me. And then Sarah would come over and, and help out a lot. And I just wanted to kind of like peep her and, and try to see what's really, what's really going on with her. And there was a point when I thought Sarah was just like playing the game too hard in that she was having too many of those serious tear jerking um, personal conversations with too many people too soon. Mm -hmm. When Yule sat there and told us about Stacy Penner, we were all, you know, our, our, our eyes were teary and we all wanted to be there for him. I think it might've been me, Sarah, Yule, uh, Nick might've been there, whatever, but you know, he had us, he had us really upset and sad. And then he walked off and we were just sitting in the shelter that we built and then he walked off and I understand sometimes I walk off because maybe I need to shed a tear or I just need a moment. I need to breathe, get this out of me so I can get locked back in the game. Um, in his case, he walked off and she chased, she, she followed him and she hugged him and did, you know, these things that they're, they're great things. But from my perspective at that point, being on the beach with Sarah Lucina for maybe a week, maybe two weeks, um, I'm like, man, she's playing the game. She had another conversation with, I think, Kim like that. And then another one with someone else and someone else. So having all these conversations quick, I'm like, she is playing the game. Um, and I thought it was all game because there was a point, I don't know who said it from Game Changers, where everyone said that um, she had everyone believing that they were, that she was their best friend. And then after the game, they learned other things. So I, I guess I kept an eye on her, but I was a little reluctant. But then as I stayed on the beach with her, I, I'm, I'm certainly a person that judges the person on how they interact with me. And um, like, for example, Johnny Fairplay. Johnny, I consider a friend. And every time I say that to someone, people laugh at me or people say, no, he's this, that, and the third. But I remember that when I was driving to Atlanta and driving back home, he told me to stop at his house uh, just to you know have a drink or whatever, take a load off. And I went and I stopped at his house. He had a meal prepared for me and my, my boy, Joey, who, who travels with me. He was cracking jokes with us and he was nice. And that was my very first interaction with Johnny Fairplay. So I judge people on how they, you know, how they treat me. So as far as Sarah's concerned, I, I just was trying to watch her instead of really, you know, interacting with her. And then as the, as the days progressed, I learned that, first of all, she was probably the strongest person on the tribe, the strongest person on the tribe, period. Take that how you want. Like there were things that she would do. Like um, when we, uh, I think we like climbed the mountain one day, she's the leader. She's like chopping down branches. I'm like, man, looking out for spiders, looking, for, looking out for snakes. <laughs> um, she'd stay up, she, she'd feed the fire. I'd wake up and she's like, she's a strong person and a great survivor player. So she was, she was earning my respect. 
And she, she, as she, like, I respected her as a survivor player. I just didn't know the person that she was. So then she like really started gaining my respect. To this day, it hasn't changed. And then there was a point where Nick said something about police right there in our shelter. Nick, who uh, was a public defender, said something about police being crooked and this, that, and the third. Everything that I truly believe and I, I can um, support. But sometimes Nick, the way he says things, it's, it's not the smoothest. It's like sometimes he'll, he'll, he'll blow up a little bit. And he, that's how he was talking about police to Sarah. It was like, man, these epic cops, they're so, they do this, that, and the third. I agree with you, Nick. But me as a black man, if I say it, it's a little different than you at, with your views saying it. So again, I wanted to just sit back and watch and just observe and not get into a racial or a political or anything because I mean, both Nick and Sarah are, are of the same political um, side of the, the line. But anyway, so as, as time went on though, I was like, you know what? I, I'm trusting Sarah and I'm getting closer with her. Um, and despite the fact that we do not see eye to eye politically, I can consider her my friend for sure. Um, or something. There's something there. There's some, I, she has my respect. She earned it. And so there was a time that I was down by the water cleaning something or doing something and she came down and that's when I decided to open up to her. And I think my first, my first words might've been, this might not be good survivor strategy or anything like that, but out of respect for you, I do respect you. This is something that I want to say to you. Um, and I told her my perspective as a black man and my interactions with police officers and, or, uh, people that look like me and how they've been treated or mistreated or mishandled or killed or whatever by police officers. And she said that she, she didn't know that these things happen. I had to, it's hard to believe that someone doesn't believe that that stuff happens. It's very hard to believe it, but I took it for what it was worth. And she also up there in the conversation with Nick, she said that in her police department, if they, so as to you, if they use profanity, if they run red lights, if they do any of these little things that I see every day in Philadelphia, if they do any of these things, they get written up or they get reprimanded or something happens to them. So I took her word for what it is and, and as genuine as she seemed or whatever, when I saw her down there at the beach, I said, hey, Sarah, this is how your um, police officer, this is how your office works. But the, the, the things that I've seen are a lot different. So maybe, you know, maybe we can learn from each other's perspectives. I wish that all police departments were as, um, as great as yours, for lack of a better term. Uh, but the reality is the things that I've seen, I, I don't believe that they are. And so she took that as a learning moment. And I took that as a learning moment that there are these police departments that do, you know, that do reprimand people for even small actions. So that was a good moment. I remember going in, um, going in a confessional on one of my walks and producers asking me about that moment. And I'm like, you know what? People get to tell their stories on Survivor and man, maybe, maybe, maybe they're gonna touch this subject. And that wasn't shown. Mm -hmm. um, but there were, there were powerful moments shown on the show. And I appreciate all those powerful moments. I just wish that um, I think that it's a very, very pertinent moment, a pertinent topic. And I think that uh, I don't know, maybe I didn't. There are people in the survivor community. I look at somebody like Jamal. When Jamal speaks, I listen. The words he's so smart. The man is brilliant. And like, I think he would be better at talking about this stuff than me mm -hmm. even. But um, it just happened to be me, and but sadly, it didn't. You know, it wasn't shown. Mm -hmm. I well, first of all, give yourself some credit. You, you're 40 minutes into just completely kicking ass on the subject, so don't, minutes. don't even, yeah, don't. I mean, we, we've talked to Jamal, and and even I, you, you took the words out of my mouth, especially with everything from last season. Jamal is the one who we're always going back to because he has such a beautiful way of talking about, talking about these subjects. And I think hearing that you and Sarah had that conversation is so incredibly productive for, for the both of you. And 
it's upsetting that that could have been what we saw and instead we were given the the, the bachelor and the bachelorette drama mm-hmm. so it's especially because we had so so much of that in season 39 and i you know the whole point of survivors is human interaction is real life people having real life conversations in the context of a game and i feel like showing that conversation or even just showing your one confessional or sarah's one confessional about it i think that could have continued the conversation and i i think at the moment a lot people need that i agree um i agree and Maybe if they were editing the show right now, um, mm-hmm. all of this civil disobedience, um, mm-hmm. it might be different. But like right now, it's it's bad out there, and it's reached that bubbling point. And it wasn't. I don't. I don't know. They maybe. I I question. I question so much. I've said it before. I don't want to. I don't want to attack producers on the show of Survivor. I love Survivor. I love the producers. I consider the producers, the camera crews, everyone. I consider them my friends. And maybe I just consider people friends too fast in life. Um, but I, I do have a lot of friends. I am a social person. That's the person. I'm a connector of people. And I, that's what I love. I, I love people. And um, so even out there, I tried to make it a point even after any confessional and anything, any interaction with any of the staffers out there, I thank them. And I uh, generally, I know them by name and I would thank them, whether it's the person with the boom mic or anything, I would try to be um, as kind to the people that were on the Island because I knew that ultimately this group of people will tell my story. And I've seen castaways on winners at war flip out at production or at, lower level production or anything. And in my head, I'm just like, what kind of fool do you have to be to, to say these whatever remarks to the people that are telling your story? So my thing was, nah, I'm gonna give them the, ut- first of all, you should just give people the utmost respect anyway, but I'm gonna give them the utmost respect because they're telling my story. And mm-hmm. then for my story to be told, um, it seemed, it seemed kind of one-sided. I tried to think about, man, did I get anyone mad? Did I piss anybody off? And then this is something that I haven't, I don't think I've talked about this on any podcast, but I'd love to share it with you guys. When we got to, um, to Selly 2.0 and we walked up and we saw the Boston Rob shelter thing, mm-hmm. it was in an area that was so cold. There were, that's where like the wind would pass through. And I was looking at this shelter that it was all like all the bamboo and all the wood was piled up and all the palm fronds, it was all piled up, excuse me, on this little three foot high thing. So it's like a three foot high rectangle. It's like a, it's like a plate pen of a rectangle that has a top on it. But to, I'm, I'm questioning, like, are you supposed to sit on top of it? But no, there was, palm fronds and wood and bamboo stacked on top of it, almost like, you know, stacked up. So no, you can't sit on top of it. So the only next logical assumption would be you sleep under it, but what you're crawling under three feet to the ground. Like this is like hip height. I had no idea what I was looking at. Like a my- coffin? Like this is yeah, yeah. So it, That's what it was. So I'm looking at this thing and you know me, I just, first of all, I can't sit still. I'm always doing something. I'm always, um, I remember on Ghost Island for the second half of the of the season um, or whenever it was, I started, I found this, I got a burlap bag that we got our uh, some more rice in and I turned it into a book bag and I was sewing it because we got the sewing kit after the, after the merge. And I would always be doing something. Ask Dom, he's like, yo, what are you doing? I still have that book bag. I was wearing it earlier today. So on Winners at War, I see this terrible shelter and in my head, I'm just like, you know what? I'm about to make this the best shelter. Actually, that's what I'm going <laughs> to So I, uh, I start disassembling it. This is within maybe a few hours of us um, touching down on this new beach. I don't remember which producer it was, and I'm not calling anybody out, but I was told you can't move that shelter. And for me to be told I can't move that shelter for me, the person that is the builder, and this is a huge part of my game, within an hour of me being on this new tribe with Parv, who I don't really know, Michelle, who I'm trying to keep my distance from, and then you tell 
the person known for building shelters on Survivor that he can't build a shelter. I think this is when I, I need to look at myself. Maybe I did have an attitude. Maybe I was upset. But who in the world tells someone on Survivor? Like, you you can't affect, like, why are you influencing the game like that? I have, I previously built shelters and the, the like the boom guys would be like, hey, Wendell, put that bamboo a little higher. So when I'm listening in on y'all, I'll just sit sit the mic on mm-hmm. top of it. I'm like, of course, I got you. I got you. Um, I, I communicate, you know, I'll, I will, I will do things so that the stories can be told and that they can get the booms in and that they can record and everything. I'll open it up. However, I, I'm in design. That's what I do. So for me to get to the island and for, and for them to say, I can't touch this, what Ben said, a dog kennel. He was like, they put us in the <laughs> kennel. That's exactly what it was. I, I can understand my um, attitude changing a little bit. Maybe I was a little foggy or something like that. I still don't think I would allow that to affect my game. So I think that first night we might have slept where they were sleeping on Selly 1.0. Nowhere near. Oh, my iPad's on 10%. Um, gonna, we can fill the dead air. You go get your charger. Yeah, I'll, you fill the dead air. I'm gonna talk about. Uh, I'm gonna talk uh, about Malolo because oh. Malolo, <laughs> Malolo. I I forget who it was, and it might not have even been somebody from Malolo. It might have been from uh, Wendell's original Navidi tribe. But I believe that somebody from somewhere had complained that the way that the shelter was set up was actually because the producer said it was visually the easiest way for them to be able to do everything. And I'm not sure how true that is. And Wendell's back now, so I'm sure he'll tell us in a second. But I remember because the wind was coming right at it. Right? And the wind was coming right at them. So it was like freezing and it was terrible, but they couldn't change where it was because that's the way they wanted it to be visually so that they could see what was going on. So the this shelter thing, I love how everybody in the chat is saying Bradley. Yeah, of course it was Bradley. But no um, podcast without talking about Bradley. I knew it was Bradley and that's why I had to say it. It's from the Malolo. It was the Malolo Beach, but it was Bradley who was talking about it. He was saying that they couldn't move their beach or their their shelter. And I think I just froze, but he was saying that they couldn't move their shelter. And so I thought that that I think that's interesting and that that's becoming more of a thing because I'm just rewatching the older seasons of Survivor and one of the biggest things in Survivor Season 2, the Australian Outback, is the fighting over do we build it in the riverbed or do we build it up at the top of the, the thing where we can get struck by lightning? They build it in the riverbed and their whole sh- their whole shelter gets washed away. So I think it's interesting that now the producer's like, well, it's easier for us if you just build your shelter right there. So this isn't the first time we're hearing something like this about the shelter. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You shout out Bradley. That's your boy, right? That's uh, yeah, so, so he, we shouted at him. We shouted out him complaining. I don't know if you've ever known him to complain about anything, but believe it or not on ghost Island at, at the first at Navidi 1.0. Um, I think my, my very first alliance was me, Bradley and Kellen. And, um, you know, then we extended to Dom and Morgan, but I didn't remember him as that much of a complainer. And then once things swapped and everything and people started coming in, they were talking about, or, or post merge, people were talking about how much Bradley was complaining and stuff. And I was shocked. And then looking <laughs> back, whoa, he's, that's him. First of all. <laughs> Brad- I love that. He's awesome. But that's. Yeah. That's Bradley's him. my, Bradley's my favorite guy from your season because every, every time he texts me, I know it's not going to be positive, but it's probably going to result in some sort of good time. It's always like, let's go to the bar so I can complain about something. And I love it. I mean, I love Cause I mean, I'm from New Jersey. That's what we do. We complain about everything. So I love when Bradley's like, hey, let's complain. But that's him. That's yeah. him. <laughs> but yeah, but that's the, the thing with the shelter, I and I haven't been out there, so I don't I guess I don't know what the rules are, but is it once a shelter is built, you you can't touch it? Or do you think it was I think it's because got like a certain someone built it? Like I, I, I don't know. I've never heard of that happening. I don't know what it was. I think that the location was definitely easier to shoot for sure. So okay. I'm going to say that it wasn't anything personal and they weren't attacking Wendell or trying to make him Wendell the villain. I will say it was probably the easiest place to shoot. But if you know me, you know that um, that that area will be something, first of all. But how about we sleep just around this little corner where there is it's not like a wind tunnel. Mm-hmm. So um, the, I think it was the next day even that, that another producer was like, Wendell, this is your island. Build, do whatever you do. 
I would want I would want to watch that. I would think everybody would want to watch that because that's your sure. thing. For sure. So then I just started, you know, deconstructing the dog kennel and <laughs> uh, the Boston Rob dog kennel. The thing is, <laughs> I'm gonna bust his balls because I truly like Rob. I, like I really, really like this guy. Text him all the time. I build stuff all the time. Um, if I put it on my Instagram, he'll he'll like it or he'll comment, and I do the same with him. So um, I love that dude. But um, yeah, so I'm deconstructing the Boston Rob dog kennel and building this other one elsewhere. And then with that whole area that was literally the dog kennel, then we we have that magnificent swing that I built that ever the awesome. the death of everyone. It was like the, yeah. <laughs> you get voted out of. But like then we have like a ten foot bench and then my my little workbench that wasn't really shown. That was a great little location. Ooh. Then we have another bench and what I call the coconut vending machine on um, when on Selly 2.0, we either won chickens or something happened at some point. And I think someone thought it was a good idea to let the chickens out or to tie them up or whatever. Long story short, it wasn't me that did the tying, but the chickens were loose and just running around. So Yule and I constructed a uh, chicken catching net mechanism where... I built this big round, probably like 15 feet in diameter round, um, um, like bamboo thing, right? Where I tied a lot of bamboo together. You know, when you, when there's a challenge, you got to tie bamboo together and get it. Uh, yeah. So I, I did something similar like that. And then I put the fishing net on it and we had it suspended up and we would like drop it on it to try to catch the chicken. <laughs> um, there were so many things out there that we built. There were so many hilarious times out there. And I, I don't know, I just, again, going back to like history being told by the person that, that, that lasts, um, mm -hmm. I got voted out at the merge, Michelle made it to uh, the final three. So they had, she had a, a much fi more favorable story than mine. But I think that, I don't think, I think that they could have still showed a great story of Michelle's of perseverance of her redeeming herself a very redemptive edit and her getting to the end and fighting from the bottom the whole time post post merge. She did phenomenal things to, to get to the end out there. And, but they could have also shown us working together. They could have mm -hmm. also shown like positive, positive things about me. They didn't have to, um, they didn't have to show me like that. Well, and I think what was most confusing for the fans was that Michelle didn't even vote you out. She didn't even vote for you the night that you got voted out. So this whole time, like, because this is me, like, as knowing that Michelle was going to win the season the entire time, as I did, I'm sitting here and I'm watching it and I'm going, okay, her move is going to be getting rid of Wendell. Like, she's going to get rid of Wendell and it's just going to propel her on her victory path. Like, she's just going to march down Main Street and she's going to win the game. And then for you to get voted out in that episode, Michelle gets zero confessionals and doesn't vote for you. It's like, so why did we just watch Michelle and Wendell like fight for the last three episodes because there was no pay. That's this is a bad storyline. There's no payoff to it. Where's the payoff? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I asked the same thing. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, going back to your building, uh, the I, this was on the original Sally tribe, but that game that we see Rob playing, where he's swinging the donut and and hooking it on the tree. Did you did you make any games too? Anything of that nature? And then I guess when you were on that on that island, were you playing it at all? Um, the the only game that I made out there was that that ring toss game, and yeah, yeah mine was a little more sophisticated than Rob's because Rob's was like a piece of it. I'm I'm gonna get my shots in at both. <laughs> I'm sure any shelter you made would be a little better than the dog kennel. I'm sure your game was better than his ring toss. With the utmost respect, um, <laughs> yeah, his, his ring was, think of a bamboo, you know, they have, they have chambers, they're hollow. So if you take like a three quarter inches of a, a sliver of bamboo, then you have like a, a, a circle and you can suspend that on a string and, and do that for your ring toss. But you want something with a little weight to it. That, that makes the game, um, hmm. that makes it more, I think that makes your, your, percentage of hooking it a little bit slightly better still a very mm -hmm. hard game but you want a little better than a little better of a percentage and so mine was made i took um one of the 
like the the weights on the from the the fishing lines or something whatever it was i strung a bunch of them together and then i wrapped it with twine so it's like a weighted circle it's a truly weighted circle and then i was able to go i don't know like 20 feet up with a, with a fishing line so our mm -hmm. game you stand back from like 15 feet and send it so and Rob was like, you know, you're, you're sending it like three feet. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love you, Rob. I love you. Who? Um, I was just going to ask, who made the calendar thing that everybody was staring at well, at the end of the game? That thing was brilliant. Like, I love I, I, that. Sophie made it, and it just got more and more and more sophisticated. First, it was literally like a calendar, and I was questioning if they'd ever show it because time and time and days aren't supposed to exist on Survivor and we're not supposed to know that it's seven o'clock on a Sunday or three o'clock on a Tuesday. And they, they were so good at making this calendar that they knew every day and they started like color coding things. This is a boot. This is a reward challenge. This is, and it was, it's so cool. I think, I think Sophie made it. I think other people contributed and I think Sophie has it right now. And Why she yeah, I guess if she made it, it makes sense. Oh gosh. Put that yeah, back this, up, Phil. This is an important question from Logan Lager here. What was your involvement with the Decal ladder? My it's not many. <laughs> I'm like, Tony, you know you got a builder over here, man. He's like, I got it, Wendell. Don't you worry. I got it. Look, it's it's built this way. You got to tie it here. This string holds me up. And I'm like, Tony, that's you not do a great part. impression. I was gonna say yours is the best one I've heard so far. A lot of people <laughs> like to impersonate him. That was the best one by far. I never the I impersonated him one time on the last podcast that I was on with uh, Hans and. I, someone said that I was good at impersonating him. I don't think I'm good at it, but mm. nonetheless, my role with the ladder was sitting back and building the shelter and other things. Cause there's, there's never a time when I'm, there's always something to build on the Island and watching him build this, but also saying like, yo, Tony, you're my guy. You're my boy. I know how to build. It would, it would take me a lot less time and probably be a lot more stable if you just let me help you out. But he really wanted to do it. So, and, and also it was like, it was comic relief being on the Island with Tony. It's um, at least on the call 1.0, it was about six, say 60 to 70 percent, just comic relief, watching this man, listening to his stories. Um, and then another percentage of him, like me learning that he is, um, first of all, he's like into real estate. He knows, like he, he has a lot of like pearls of wisdom that he was like giving me while we were building. And I appreciated that. But then I also was like learning about his children and his wife and that he is like a, a true good family man. And this is something that we didn't know or we didn't necessarily see on his other seasons. So it was great to learn about that aspect aspect of Tony. But then there's that little 10%, I'd say, or 5% even, or 2% of the old Tony that can, like, if he has to turn it on, he will run circles around that island and tell lies to everybody and have you just have your head spinning. Um, the Tyson boot, him and Tyson, like, there was something going on between him and Tyson the whole time, like, I think it was more so Tony towards Tyson because Tyson's like, yo, Wendell, what's this guy's issue with me? And um, it was always, we as a tribe would always laugh at their interactions, but sometimes you could see like, if someone, one is joking with the other, you could see that like one of them would kind of take it a little personal or something like, or as if they need a reason to vote them out or something like that. But, um, and I think, you know what I think? After Winners at War, I had a, a charity poker event where a bunch of the winners came and I was shocked and humbled. And I was, I couldn't believe that, like, it was like Michelle, Jeremy, Tyson flew in, Rob flew in, um, Tony came down, Tony doesn't go to anything. There were a bunch of winners and, you know, everybody was there. So I was so thankful and happy and we raised a bunch of money for the charity. Um, but Tony arrives, like, pulled, like, Scourges in to the, the hotel on two wheels and gets out, walks into the, the poker tournament and yells, this is 
maybe two months after we recorded, right? So like the cast has leaked, but that's about it. He walks in and screams, the champ is here. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> Dude. <laughs> and then he proceeds, he proceeds, I'm like, tell, uh, I hope this doesn't get to write it. So then uh, he proceeds to, um, there. Uh, I'll, okay. I hit that okay. accidentally, but let's actually get to that after. Yeah. But then Tony proceeds to sit right next to Tyson or at Tyson's table. I know nothing about poker. I don't play it, but I'll throw a good party where they're playing poker. Um, he sits at his table and he proceeds to continue to like break his bank or whatever it is just <laughs> to break uh, Tyson's bank. I don't whatever it is when you buy going it, all in. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And he did that like at least three times and he kept on buying new chips and stuff. And I'm like, man, if this person who walked in screaming the champ is here and then proceeds to spend like four grand just to make sure that Tyson was going to like lose, if that's not a spoiler. Um, but fortunately, I, I don't I don't know. if I just think that that all the fans that were there, it was cool because the ratio oh my of God. the five or winners players, fans, it was like um, maybe like 15 survivors and maybe like 25, 30 fans. So the ratio was just amazing. You're sitting at a table um, next to Dom and, and Tony and Tyson, and there are two fans at the table. Mm -hmm. And you watch Dom screaming, talking trash over there to Boston Rob. And Boston Rob's like, man, I don't even know you that much yet or whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> see these interactions so that was that was a great event um and that's tony is tony he can really turn it on so i say all this to say that on the call 1.0 when when the tribe was able to see like tony as a different player there still was that fraction of tony that was an absolute psychopath <laughs> I love yeah. that. I mean, that's, uh, I find Tony to be so fascinating right now because everything we've heard about Tony is not what you expect. He's a North Jersey cop. I know a lot of North Jersey cops who all they do is sports and drink beer. And, and that's like, that's like their thing. Like that really is like, that's what they do. My dad grew up in North Jersey. I know a lot of like the Tony type for Tony to not like sports to not go and do anything. I mean, Sarah was telling us he doesn't drink caffeine. He doesn't drink, like he would be mad at you for drinking that coffee or not. Like he's so fascinating to me because then he goes out on this Island and he builds a freaking spy nest and he's wearing like cutaway, whatever pants. Uh, which, are those fashionable? Would you buy those? I, I don't know. Anyway. Have you heard about these? Pants? Uh, he yeah. To Sarah told us. And put <laughs> buttons on the sides. I'm like, Tony, another thing that I could probably help you with, but do your thing. But he, he was, that he was that comic relief. Um, it was it was great. I think that the way Tony can kind of subdue himself so much, but still have that whatever in him. I think I don't know about Tony's past, but I think he has had a colorful past. Um, so like, so I think he has stuff in him where he can he can you know think back to those crazy moments. Uh, he told he told us about like places he's traveled and reasons why he's traveled and people he's seen and all that stuff. So he has he's seen and done a lot to where he can probably refer back to that and go crazy. But also he's now a family man and a great uh, person, so he can he can also draw from there. I love that. Yeah, I, uh, I go ahead. Uh, go ahead. I was just, just going gonna... to say the question was, did I ever talk to Tony? About oh yeah, yeah. Put that back. Should, should we should we answer that? Mm -hmm. or? Yeah, mm -hmm. let's go. Let's go for it. Yeah. So, um, it was. Did we ever? Did I ever talk to Tony about police and race relations? And my answer is no, I didn't. I, um, I felt, I actually felt closer with Sarah. Tony and I would build a lot together. We spent a lot of time together. Um, but Sarah, for some reason, I, I felt a little closer to her to where I could open up to her about that. And, um, so I, I haven't had that conversation and mm -hmm. it will probably be a good conversation to have with Tony. Sounds like you were, you were too busy saving his life from that ladder. <laughs> <laughs> I, man, we marched that ladder to that tree and this ladder had to be 20 feet, 15 to 20, it had to be almost 20 feet tall mm -hmm. and to watch him. And on his first step, the the, wrong, the thing broke, and he's like, "No, no, it's designed that way." And we're like, "What?" Okay, Tony. Um, Things aren't designed to break, Tony. 
That's not how things work. I don't want to wish anyone in this game to be hurt or injured or medevac, but if Tony Blockos accidentally, let's say on that first rung, if he accidentally like landed the, his ankle and rolled his ankle on a rock and he had to be taken out of the game, I would I would feel for him as a human being. But I also have to say it would be better for Tony Blockos not to be on this on that island anymore because of as, as what you saw, he he's such a great survivor mm-hmm. player. He he ran circles around a group of winners. Mm-hmm. And it was so evident to me post merge who was running the game. Mm-hmm. And yeah. and my vote out where they said it was uh it was it was so where they showed it was Sophie saying no nope, yeah. Um, Tony had a huge hand in it. And, and so you're saying that you could tell it was Tony post merge. You're over, you go over to the edge cause you're the, you're the merge boot. You go over to edge of extinction. It's all pretty much all people. You had a hand in voting out in some way. I mean, Amber's over there, but, uh, well, you didn't vote up Austin, but then Parvati's over there. Yule's over there. You know, a lot of people that you did have a hand in voting out was a lot of the conversation over there about what was still going on in the game. Or had it kind of just shifted and Edge was its own thing and the game was felt separate from it? From my perspective, and I'm not – excuse me. It's it's not – I don't totally remember, but what I do remember throughout my interactions was the Edge, it got very clicky as the time went on. And um, me and my people, we weren't talking too much about the game. It was really this – this space where I had I had a fine time on the edge. Um, I think I think I had a better time on the edge than other people because everyone was talking about how miserable it was and all that stuff. And a lot of these people had uh, wife and kids, family, whatever to come back home to, and I had none of that. So I mean, I, I yeah, of course I had my family that I missed tremendously, but um, I didn't have like a wife and kids to come home to. So every morning or whatever, I would like look out on this beautiful beach and just, I'd be thankful. And mm. I would, I would take it in with the understanding that a lot of these players won't come back or they've been saying they won't come back. Mm-hmm. So my edge experience, aside from a couple little negative interactions was I, I kind of enjoyed it because I knew that like, when, when am I going to get this experience again? And this time on the edge, we're looking forward to, that one challenge to bring us back into the game. When I got to the edge, people had already won a lot of things, found a lot of things, hit a lot of things, decided amongst themselves, hey, we're not going to share things, be it um, food or peanut butter or whatever, but also like the way that we found advantages or anything. We're not going to share any of this stuff with the people coming in. And so that'll help our game and hurt the Wendell's or even the Yules or the Adam Kleins of the game. Um, some people say that you know being voted off early is the flaw. It's it's a flaw in the edge where you know a Natalie can then become the 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 person that amasses a million fire tokens, but she was the first boot and someone that lasted longer in the game mm-hmm. um, may may have played a better game or whatever or whatever the circumstances allowed someone to last longer in the game they have a, a worse shot of getting back into the game for lasting longer. That's a little anti-survivor, if you ask me. But regardless, and to, an- to go back to answering the question, um, on the edge, there were the clicks, and you did talk a little bit about the game, but you talked a lot about your family and getting back home and other things because it was just this purgatory until you were to fight your way back into the game. That's when we're going to put our war paint on. That's when, when it's go time. Um, mm-hmm. but after, after, um, after someone would be voted out after tribal and someone would come in, you talk about the game or you say, oh man, did you hear that? Did you see when this person did that? That's when there'd be a lot of game talk. But from my perspective, not generally on the edge, mm-hmm. I could be wrong. That was just my experience being a later addition to the edge and someone that turned people off because they were voted out right before me. Yeah, and and Alexa and I are super anti edge, so we hate edge. But you know, when I do, you think that based on what you're saying here, it seemed like you know the the early boots, especially since they were the old schoolers, probably had a little bit more history together. They're kind of sticking together and they're clicky, like you were saying. 
was it just like at that point, like, would you have ever considered voting for anybody who was who had been voted out of the game to win an all winner season anyway? Or like, did they kind of ruin their chances of getting a vote from you because at that point they just kind of outcasted you and, and everybody else yeah. who started getting voted out? It's easy for me to like pander to people and say, oh, I would never vote for anyone to come back from the edge. It's like easy for me to say that. Um, but again, I don't want to rewrite history. There were people on the edge that I really respected. And, and the, we like, if you, you, at the end of the game, you're voting based on whatever you want to vote for, for that person that's sitting there. So I say Yule fought his way back into the game and ended up sitting next to, um, let's say Nick and, um, I'm not going to say Michelle, cause I know who you would vote for. Um, let's say you'll. Yule fights his way back in and sits next to like Nick and Sarah Lucina. Um, mm -hmm. Sarah played a strong game. Nick played his game strong or whatever. It, it was a little whatever. We could talk about that too. Um, but if <laughs> Yule gets back in, Yule is the kind of person. He's so, so brilliant, so good at talking. Um, throughout the season, he was so good at putting a smile on your face because he's quirky and he's funny. Like he every morning – he give you these weird hugs, these little awkward hugs, like "Hey, good morning." Uh. It's like, <laughs> like it's like an awkward hug. Like, hey, get over here and hug me. Give me a good. I, hug. I have to say though, Wendell, before before you move on with that, I have to say I called that out. I think it was episode one or two where he literally said to somebody, "Like, can I have a hug?" And I was like, even when he asks for a hug, it like it's 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 like this. I don't know how old Wendell you is. Was it? Was he like forty years old? But it's like this cute, awkward, like teenage boy like can i have a hug? like it's it's amazing i love it yes that's you and then you just laugh at it and he's so he's so far removed from the game i mean as we learned like he had a bunch of alliances going into the game but he was so far removed from the production side of things that he'd always be asking all of these questions to production or about production and i'm in my head i'm like man of course you can go get that coconut off of, like the simplest <laughs> things but you was always um communicating and, and asking those things. So again, I, um, if there's like a Yule sitting at the end and I'm on the edge and he fought his way back from the edge, I can't say that I wouldn't vote for him mm -hmm. based on many things. It could be based on the fact that, um, on DeCal 1.0, he was, he was saying if he would have won, he would have donated all his money mm -hmm. to, um, Stacey Penner, to, to a ALS. Um, so mm -hmm. if there there are a handful of people that were on the edge that had they won their way back into it, I truly can't say that I would not vote for them just because of the fact that they were on the edge. And, and, the and now respect or that same courtesy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And now I'll ask just the last question I have about this edge thing, but then we heard rumors and I don't know if there's any truth to it, but at the final three, when it was Natalie, Tony and Michelle, there it's were true. rumors that you, it's true that you, Nick, Adam were considering voting for Michelle to try to get her second, but then we're concerned that Natalie. So kind of going back to the last question was Natalie, just somebody that you, you were just like, I'm never going to end up voting for Natalie to win the game here. I got to a point with Natalie, a personal point that I would never vote for her to win the game in winners at war. If something might have, I'm not cool with her to this day. Something could happen um, outside of the game and we can be co come cool again or whatever. But because of what happened in the game, I'm not I'm turned off by 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 her uh, for mm -hmm. sure. And I'll elaborate. But um, what was wait, what was that? What was the question? So so then the other part of the question, well, obviously that answered half of it. But then the other part of the question was, were you guys really considering trying to vote for Michelle to get her oh, yeah. second? But we're worried that if you did split the votes, it would accidentally result in Natalie winning. Yeah, this can this will speak to kind of my the way I view the the game survivor, the respect that I have for the game, and also um, where I was with Natalie. Okay, when I when I first got to the edge, she said some things that um, made me believe that like she was like she was like down to work with me and like you know locked in, and. Um, she also said some things like that weren't so friendly about Jeremy. So she could have been, uh, she could have been playing, just playing the game, which, you know, whatever, say, you say whatever to whoever to make, 
your case a little better or to what to do that. And I think that's what Michelle was kind of doing on Sally, saying whatever to whoever about me, despite being friends with me. Okay. So in Natalie's case, um, we 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 butted heads on the on on the on the on the edge. Um, but wait, what about Michelle? Oh, as far as so so I wouldn't um I did not want Natalie to win for sure because of how she treated genuine good people on the edge. Like, how can you how can you get in a fight with Yule? She was like mean to him. This guy is has the heart, he has the biggest heart in the world. Anyway, um, so I, I I didn't want her to win for sure. But and I was saying this can show you my mentality and how much I respect the game of Survivor. I knew that Tony played hands down the best game out there, period. So as much as I wanted my friend to come in second, Michelle to come in second, I was scared that um, me, Adam, I think maybe Danny, I th not you, um, but me, Adam, Dan me, Adam, Danny, Nick, maybe. Um, mm -hmm. We were going to throw votes at Michelle because she's our friend and we want her to be second. And because Natalie was not so friendly to people on the edge. So Tony will win because he's the GOAT. But Michelle will come in second because first and foremost, in a game about getting to the end and not being voted out, she got to the end and she wasn't voted out. Um, but secondly, Natalie rubbed us the wrong way. So, But then when we started seeing people... We heard rumblings because you don't necessarily know who everyone's voting for. So when we started hearing rumblings that, man, some people might vote for Natalie and, man, we don't know how many people are. We got to the point where we had to vote for Tony so that Winners at War Season 40 will have the right winner. The best mm -hmm. player will win the game. And also so that if we accidentally throw – four votes to Michelle that it doesn't completely fit flip things and still allow Natalie to win Michelle to come in second and like Tony to come in third. I, 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 I don't, the edit, I don't know how the edit would be for a season like that, but mm -hmm. like you, you guys saw what Tony was doing out there and he deserved to win. So that's why. So there's absolute truth to the fact that I wanted to vote for Michelle. Um, I didn't see, the voting confessionals, but um, I think that when I wrote Tony's name down, before I even revealed it, I said, hey, Michelle, I wish you weren't sitting next to the greatest player or something to that tune mm -hmm. when I revealed it. So, um, yeah, I wanted, her, I wanted her to be in second for sure. And, and if Tony weren't, if Tony wouldn't have gotten to the final, like let's say he loses to Sarah at the fire making, because we had talked to Sarah about this, but I just kind of want to hear what the jury perspective was on this. If Sarah wins that and it's Sarah, Michelle and Natalie, might we be coming out of survivor season 40 with a Natalie victory? Like were, were there enough people on that jury who were willing to vote for, cause I know we obviously got the four votes and I doubt those would have changed had it been Sarah sitting there instead of Tony, but were there more people who were kind of thinking that way? I, I haven't run the numbers, but everyone would have a few, at least three or four votes. So mm -hmm. um, it's very easy. It's very easy to think that um, if, if she was, if she gave a good final tribal speech that she could have swayed one or two votes because I can see Michelle having four votes. Uh, there are automatic votes. Like if Tony, if Sarah Lucina is sitting there, we as uh, players knew her alliance, Tony, uh, Ben, Denise, those are some automatic votes. Mm -hmm. Then you say Michelle, Wendell, Adam, Nick, automatic votes. Um, then you have a player like you, Natalie, he's not voting for Natalie, mm -hmm. but He's not voting for Michelle because um, on the edge, Yule was very hurt that he pre-gamed with Michelle. Mm -hmm. He he felt this. Think of think of who Yule is and all he all he is. This amazing man. He thought that he kind of got played, mm -hmm. and that's that's what I thought when I got. I, we were comparing played notes on mm -hmm. the edge, mm -hmm. and he truly felt like a fool, um, and which he's not by any means. So he's not voting for Michelle. So. He's not voting for Natalie, so he's voting for Sarah Lucina, hmm. I think. And it's um, I haven't done the numbers, but yeah, 
had had Tony been voted out, there could have been a Natalie win. Mm -hmm. There could have been. I yeah. I question her social game. I think that there are little things that she could have done to to get extra votes at the end. Um, I mean, obviously, I think she should have competed against Tony at Fire. Obviously, the blueprint was there with Underwood. But other than that, it's like, dude, you got a, a, a few days left on the edge. Just just act. Act like you're cool with the rest of the people. Yeah. 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 Oh, after well, Tony beat Sarah Lucina, um, and he was they were both crying, so they were sobbing like babies. Um, it was such a nah, I, I don't say it to make fun of him. I'm saying like it was a touching moment. If you ask me, yeah. someone who who um, admires Tony's gameplay, but also him um, as a as a, a man, as a, a father and a husband, and then from my perspective, also getting to know Sarah Lucina and changing my viewpoint on her, um, watching. Them compete at fire. Tony's um, Tony's not a good fire maker at all. He shaves mm -hmm. men into a pile. We're over there just like, what is this guy doing? He then like scrapes it all into his hand. And he doesn't know what he's doing. <laughs> uh, he, got, he got lucky to beat Sarah. But um, after that, when they hugged, it was a very touching moment. And then Tony said, he like looks at Natalie. He's like, see, I, I told you, you could have beat me. He just started. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Also, it was it wasn't him like making fun of her. her. It was him being like funny Tony, and he yeah. had us cracked up again. And it was it was a lighthearted moment. I thought that I would have. I thought they were gonna you know use that clip, but they didn't. But uh, well, they I think why they didn't use it is they almost wanted it to look like Tony and Sarah were in this epic competition that took seconds. Yeah. And I have heard otherwise from more than just you, Wendell. I have heard otherwise. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he is. He is as trash at making fire as somebody on Ghost Island was at rapping. <laughs> there you go. There you go. And but the scary. But was there somebody that that unnamed person on Ghost Island would have been able to beat in a rap battle because Tony beat Sarah? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> crazy. Now nah, Chris Noble could beat me at a rap battle. <laughs> he's a uh, he's he's I don't know. Uh, yeah, Tony beat Sarah. He had the right. He had the right. He had the right one. Because yeah. I think Michelle or Natalie would have beaten him. Yeah, and that's that's what we were kind of that's what we were kind of thinking. So, um, well, something I wanted to say here, because because obviously you bring up the noble thing. I just wanted to I just wanted to say it too, like for anybody out there who did decide like watching season forty that Wendell talked too much shit. I just want to say like season thirty six Wendell, best shit talker in Survivor history, and I mean that as a compliment because like you were saying earlier, like the the greats MJ, Larry Bird, they talked the most crap that's what they did and i think people forget that on your first season like the moment for you up to that point was that confessional everybody was like what where did this come from and it was it was awesome and everybody loved it but again when you shit talk and win everybody's like this is our guy when you shit talk and lose it's like oh he's cocky and he's arrogant and you know it goes the other way yep. yeah it, it, it'll bite you if you lose for sure and yeah. i guess uh, all the trash I talked on season 40, it, it, it bit me. Um, yeah. Uh, but they, they didn't show some of it. I saw, there was like, there was some like legitimate trash, not even trash talking things to, to get in people's heads. For example, um, I think during ghost Island, I was doing a slingshot and I'm like talking to Dom over there while he's doing the, his slingshot. <laughs> We're competing. I'm like, Hey Dom, how you doing? Mr. Body, you know, and I'm, I'm shooting. And I think I did something similar to Ben who doesn't like being called Benjamin, but because mm. we weren't on the beach together, I didn't know that. So there was, um, you need to get the door, Phil? Get some pizza coming or something? Oh, he's on mute. Okay, keep going. Uh, so uh, <laughs> so I, think, I think there was a slingshot contest or like an un untying contest that wasn't shown for a, a reward challenge, a pizza reward challenge. And I look over and I'm like, Benjamin or something like that, and I'm tying. And then fast forward to the the merge and he's I called him Benjamin again. He's like, I don't like it's Ben. I was like, Yikes. <laughs> it's a good <laughs> it's a good strategy though. I mean, that's a good way to get in people's heads. It's like, I mean, when you're, you know, if you're if you don't think you can beat them regular, or even if you do, it's a good way to just, you know, throw them off their game. I don't know. I think it's I think it's a good strategy. And you know, you were just talking about the fire making challenge, just really emotional moment. You know, you're like as a family man, you know, it's making you, you know, it's hitting your emotion. And in your fire making challenge, you're sitting over there and you're beating Angela and you're staring at Dom like, yeah, this is what's happening right now. And it's a, it's 
It's I don't know, man. I, I I love it. I love the I love the shit talk. I, it's from my from so. my from my mentality at that point. Um, I think that look was more so like I didn't I didn't want to beat Angela. Um, I wanted I wanted to make it to the final three. I didn't necessarily want to beat it. That was like it was a no contest, and I think that mm-hmm. look was like, man, why why are you doing this to me? Yeah. It wasn't like, yeah, I'm coming for you, fool. What's up? <laughs> it's <was> like, <laughs> yeah, and yeah. And I was, I was even on Ghost Island, especially actually in any Survivor Challenge. I don't think you'll see me win and like be super hype or excited about about the wins in the challenges and stuff. Because I think I might have seen like my buddy Jervis maybe celebrating too hard or something. People look at you when you celebrate too hard in the game of Survivor. So, um, but with that one, with that fire making, it was more like it hurts to beat Angela at fire making. I'm not. I'm not, this is like, it's like playing Angela at basketball. That's, basketball is not her event. I, I'll, I'll beat her at basketball, but I don't know. It just, it didn't feel, it felt great to get to the end of Survivor and be able to plead your case. But against Ange, it, you know. It's mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I feel that. I but haven't. I, I'm glad I didn't go against Dom because that man can make fire very fast. You know? yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then yeah. he would have been the the villain of season forty. <laughs> yeah, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't have beaten me, but it yeah. Was- <laughs> um, I have a logistical question that I think Dalton Ross asked you. How do you how do you do a whole challenge with, with a toothpick? Like, how do you how do you get how do you swim and get to the end and, and still have it there, like as if it didn't move? Okay. Um, I, I take the toothpick out of my mouth. I put it in my shorts and I, and I compete. Um, I usually have a bunch of those toothpicks. First of all, I have a bunch of them and like, I might have three in the waistband of my, um, let's call them shorts at all times. Yeah. Yeah. So I always have them, but like there would be challenges that require a lot of focus and not so much, um, physical exertion and, in those, I could keep the tooth. All right, maybe maybe that's me being a little a little extra confident, like having a toothpick in my mouth that was something that might re- require a little balance or anything like that. But the the bigger challenges where like you're doing crazy things, I'm probably gonna spit that toothpick out at some point if it's not before the challenge, during the challenge. But um, I don't advise any future Survivor players to <laughs> do anything crazy with toothpick. I wanted to ask too, because uh, because I almost completely forgot. How close were you at that in that final challenge on Edge? Like, how close yeah, were you, you to were, knocking off Natalie? Because you were right there. Close it like. was I? I was, you were like had that. I was supposed to win it. Like I was dusting them. I sunk my first ball. I think as she walked up, and I'm talking my trash too. Like I'm quoting people. I had like some Muhammad Ali quotes in there. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I was supposed to win it, and um. Any ch- a challenge like that that requires all that stuff that's that's for me and it was it was funny watching all the people talk about who should win their way back in a, a player like Tyson yeah a, a challenge like that is built for a player like Tyson it's built for a player like Rob it's built for a player like Natalie it's built for a player like me and I put myself I'm confident in my ability so um, yeah I was ahead of all of them by far Natalie. She couldn't get out of the ropes. And then like, um, and then when I'm building that rope ladder, talking to myself way ahead of everybody, and then I get to it and I literally, you have to sink two balls. One of my balls was sunk and I hear Jeff saying like, all right, Natalie's here or Tyson's close. So um, how close was I? I got that, um, the ball to the second hole more than once, maybe more than twice when it fell off. Oh my God. And I think she got her, she sunk hers maybe her second ball like maybe on the first or second try she was very wow she killed she killed that like um and i understand like there are people that when they're under that kind of pressure like she had all the advantages coming in she'd been on the edge she was the mayor of the edge and she she got out it was was, she was slow out the blocks but once she locked in at the end she performed she Mm -hmm. she did what she had to do me i was ahead the whole time and sometimes that's not a, like um, that's not the best position. You set the you set the pace. Like um, if any if there are any track runners listening or anything, mm-hmm. sometimes you don't want to be the person at the front of the pack in a, a longer race. 
you want to be the person right behind them or two behind them yep. on that last lap, you're gone. Yep. You Sit on their shoulder, man. Sit on your shoulder until the bell lap. That's all you do. Today? Yep. That's it. So, That's it. Close. No. And it, it, I mean, yeah. And, and I mean, I could see how, you know, when you get too far ahead, you might start to feel a little comfortable. And then all of a sudden you, you almost relax, but not in a way that, you know, not in a way that would make you lose the challenge, but enough to just calm yourself down almost in a bad way. Like you almost need that adrenaline a hundred percent pumping at that yeah, point. For sure. For sure. Yeah, we got a question. Yeah. I'm, we got I'm a just... question here from Jordan Alford. I just wanted to throw this one up real quick. Uh, sorry. He said the beard comb, please. How did you make that? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I made it. I, I took like a sliver of bamboo, you know, uh, Bamboos, as we said, it's like it's they have some thick bamboo out there. And I like if you take maybe one inch of the outside of it, then it's like a flat, almost a flat piece of bamboo. And then I took that and I took the saw and I slowly sawed little parts of it out. You have a lot of time on your hands. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I wish maybe I shouldn't have been building a beard comb. Maybe I should, should have been checking in with people. But I remember building that comb, making carving that comb. Um, probably uh, within days of me being the merge boot. If it mm -hmm. wasn't the day before, it was the day I was getting, actually, no, the day I was the merge boot was when I was making some beautiful chopsticks. So I love that. <laughs> Shouldn't have been doing that. But yeah, I just, I just slowly and methodically uh, sawed little ridges into the little piece of bamboo and that was like the third version of it because the first two if the if the teeth were too close together they would break off so mm -hmm. it was uh it probably took a while but at least the beard was on point you know <laughs> yeah that's what's important i agree i'm just was, upset I, in that last challenge um you're you're throwing around muhammad ali quotes and they don't show that like if they're ooh. gonna give you an edit at least be consistent about it right right i think i, I would love a that young man rumble like or something like that. But I also said like, there were, there, there are quotes or things that I would say to build myself up, but also things that I would say to like, yo, like lock in, you know, to, to bring me back down. Like, I think I might've said like slow and steady wins the race or something at some point. That's not a Ali quote, but that's just no. like, Wendell, chill Good out, one. focus. Yeah. I think that's what I said right before or right when I was trying to sink the balls. But um, yeah, I was, there were things that I was saying, I was, I was hyping myself up. When I go into those challenges, that's where my head is. I, I'm a competitor. That's what I love doing, competing. So you'll see me like, like I'll be ready. I'll be locked in. I'll look like I'm angry. I'm not angry. Just it might be my resting, um, resting, ready to, ready to, ready to go face or something. It's just, <laughs> it's just yeah. yeah. That's what. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, everybody, everybody on that season. Going into that final challenge, aside from probably Adam Klein, had that resting like I'm gonna kill you phase. I'm gonna win this challenge. I'm gonna go back into the game. I'm gonna prove that I should have been. I should have never been voted out. Everybody had that look on their face. So it's not just. I mean, th that's the competitive edge, though. You're not gonna get a winner of Survivor who's not competitive. I mean, right. that's really what. It, I mean, yeah. even down to somebody like Michelle who doesn't really win the challenges, things like that. She talks about her board games, and like I love board games. It terrifies me when she was talking to us about the board game. Cause I'm like, damn, like that, that sounds like not as much fun as it is stressful. Like maybe yeah. that way. So that's just survivor winners. You're, yeah, the winners, you're all competitive. There's something they, they, they like go to a certain place to compete, especially at what they're good at. Michelle's very good at like the puzzles and she's great socially. I will say, um, I, I, I thought I thought we were each other's number ones going into the game. So that's her doing a great job of playing Survivor before the game even started. And um, other people thought the same. Um, so yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I had one mother, one other thing to say about Michelle. Um, oh, so when I got voted out, I was very uh, upset with her. And as once you know, Jeff said that it was me. I looked at her. She looked at me and said, she, she, um, mouthed like, like I didn't know mm -hmm. to me. And so I'm walking away and I, I was just like grilling her like, man, mm -hmm. old lady. <laughs> so <laughs> then I get up and I walk, Jeff snuffs my torch. I say like, good game guys. I'm walking off. 
And I know that I saw so many votes. I know that I think three people voted for Adam. I assumed obviously it was me and my allies, Michelle and Nick. And I just, um, re I remembered her plan to get Parv's tokens, her and Yule's plan to get Parv's tokens. So I'm like, man, maybe she just played the same thing. She voted with me and she was truly against me. Um, regardless, regardless, she's my friend. Here's a token for Michelle. Nick rode with me to the end. Here's a token for Nick. Maybe they both, you know, maybe they both knew and now they both have my fire tokens. But at the end of the day, I couldn't, I didn't have anyone else that I wanted to give it, give them to at that point. And then as people got voted to the edge, I started learning that Michelle was left out of the vote and that she, once she got back to um, the merged beach, she was like kind of upset. Um, I was so blindsided. I left my sneakers and my bandana at the beach. When uh, Ben got to the beach, I think he took my bandana and Michelle like yelled at him and got it back from him. And she also, she gave it to me at the end of the game. But as people were coming, they were telling me how Michelle was like riding for me. And so I think the very next vote out, so this is before anyone came and told me that, I walk in, I sit down mad at Tribal and she, I think she mouthed to me like it wasn't me or something like that. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm just like grilling her like, yeah. <laughs> upset but then ultimately oh, we we kind of communicated even though i'm not able to talk to her like through nods and stuff i'd be like stay strong and things like that and so as the time went on i'm sure she knew as a player in the game that i was rooting for her to stay in the game however she could which is how she stayed in the game um and even after um after the win back challenge when I, I looked at her and she's right after I lost, after being up front the whole time, and then Jeff lines us all up, I look over at her and she just starts crying. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, again, I'm like, stay strong, stay strong. Just whispering and mouthing it to her because she's like, you know, 40 feet away from me. But um, I think that can show like where I was with Michelle. Like I, even at the end, I still want my friend to do her thing out there. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. No, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, so have we, have we not hit on anything yet? I know we're, we're about like an hour and 40 here. I, we've kind of gone from beginning to end. We've talked about the things going on in you know, society right now. Have, is there anything that we haven't hit on that you wanted to like bring up or talk about that we haven't talked about yet? Um, I, well, I appreciate you guys for letting me come on. Um, this morning, I, I'm like, man, I, I, I use, I try not to use a lot of profanity when I do stuff. Right. You know, maybe I'll, I'll talk a little trash with my <laughs> friends, but I'm like, man, I, I'm like, I don't want to go on an effing survivor podcast right now. I'm, I got people that look like me being killed by the police in the streets <laughs> and people that look like me and allies. And, um, you know, I have so many people fighting for justice right now. And there's so much that I want to say. And I have people that are sending me text messages um, that aren't speaking out. So then in my head, are you trying to appease me because you see that I'm in pain? Or do you just not know how to speak up because of who's around you or because you've never spoke out? Um, so like there's so much going on. I feel so passionate about what's going on right now. I'm trying to use my, my small platform to bring light to the subject and also to educate people because some people don't understand how to be an ally. Some people, uh, Kellen called me yesterday, um, yesterday and she basically said, Hey, Wendell, I wrote this Instagram post and I didn't post it because of fear. She was afraid of a lot of things. First of all, she's afraid of people that look like me saying, Oh, white girl, you don't know, you don't know what it's like. And, you'll never know. Or she's afraid of people in her own, um, people that look like her saying it's a non-issue or judging her for that. And what I told her was, you will have those people. You'll have black people that say, you're not saying it the right way. And you'll have white people that say, man, that doesn't exist. But from my perspective, if you 
take the extra step and do something, say something. Don't just send Wendell Holland a text message because you see him tweeting multiple tweets every day. Don't just retweet things. Like if you actively do something, yes, so you might turn some people off that are either blind, that are willfully blind to injustice because it is a real thing. But at the end of the day, you're being an ally and you're showing people, you're showing the people that need to see it, that you're standing with them for justice. Mm -hmm. um, Dom, Dom went on his Instagram after Ahmaud Arbery was chased down and killed. And Dom didn't, I don't think he had any black friends until me, um, or not many. And his perspectives were, were very narrow until we met. And he continues to remind me of that. And I have, and the people around him also, they, they question a lot of things that he says and does nowadays because his perspective has changed. He's open to change and open to learning about other people's perspectives. And he went on his Instagram and posted a video of him talking about um, the Ahmad was out running and he was chased down and shot. Dom said, basically, when I go on a run, the only thing I worry about is what I ate this morning because it might mess up my stomach. Whereas my best bud, Wendell Holland, um, he might have to wear his like his law school across his chest. He might have to run in the middle of the street. He might have to avoid certain neighborhoods and he might still get shot because he's running in the middle of the street. Um, and for him to, to go outside of his comfort zone and post this video of him speaking, you could see it on his face. It meant so much to someone like me who has been searching for these type of allies. I have best friends um, from growing up that never took that extra step that would see um, or hear about George Zimmerman shooting Trayvon Martin and see how, how I'd be grieving for days, weeks, months, and see my posts on my social media. And they, would, they wouldn't even text me, let alone say something to the public showing that they are an ally. So um, I say all this to say, I've gotten many calls, texts, um, I've seen a lot of retweets and stuff, but um, I, I don't, and people ask me how to be allies. A lot of students, um, middle schoolers, high schoolers, I have so many DMs like, hey, Wendell, I hear your story. I didn't know that, that you felt this way because, you know, my Instagram is my highlight reel. Generally, I put me smiling and having a good time on my Instagram, um, and I've done that for the last two years before Survivor. I was an adamant advocate for social justice and issues. I would always post something and I wouldn't be scared of it. After Ghost Island, I saw my followers go up and down whenever I would post anything political or social or anything like that. And I cared about those superficial things then because I was looking for other opportunities. I thought, man, uh, if I post something then someone might see it the wrong way and I won't get on Survivor again, or I might not get another opportunity. But hey, guess what? I've been on Survivor again, and now I am the Wendell that was before Survivor, and I'm the Wendell that will speak out. And although, again, I don't know everything by any means, but I will at the very least try to educate people around me and let them know that the best way is to speak out and to do something and to show people that you're a true ally. Because the way I see it right now is there are two sides to this. It's a racist side and an anti-racist side. It's not, um, it's not, oh, I'm indifferent. No, it, your, your willful blindness, your indifference, uh, the fact that you aren't speaking up, it is an endorsement of racists and racism. And um, it's, it's something that, the, a silence is so deafening. When I spoke about my friends growing up, I, their silence to me killed me and it, it pulled me back and it, it made me, it depressed me and all of that. So um, I'm just to whoever is listening. And now it's like, we're so long into this podcast, but I appreciate you guys for allowing me to speak and allowing us to go so long. Um, find ways to be allies. If this is something that you truly believe in, if it's in your heart and you might experience backlash, but I think that the people that judge your intent and where it's coming from in your heart 
are the people that you should appeal to and you shouldn't worry or be scared to say things because of people that may or may not criticize you for you using your voice to change the nation for the good. Yeah. Thanks for coming to my TED talk. Yeah, that was amazing. That was amazing. I'm like, I'm listening to you. I'm looking at the chat over here. And I mean, it's just, it's like, we're getting comments in here. Like, how could they edit this guy as a villain? Like, how could this guy be like, because it's just like, no, man, like everything you just said there. I mean, uh, it's amazing. It's awesome. And I'm glad we got to have this early in the podcast. And I'm glad we got to have it at the end too. So the people who stuck around, but also the people who only listen for 20 minutes, I mean, you know, we were able to cover it like the entire time. Cause it is, it's so important. And I mean, when I heard you were going on the Russell Hans podcast, my initial reaction is what the heck is going on? Like, how is this happening? But I think you had said like the most important thing right now is you have to talk to people you don't necessarily agree with because otherwise it's just going to keep driving a wedge, you know? And it's, it's about trying to, you know, bring everything together because it's just, it's, we're at a point that who would have thought we'd ever be. It's just insane. It's insane. Yeah, it's and with Russell in his case, I, I tip my hat to him because I, I had my prejudgments for sure, and I know for a fact Russell, um, whether okay, whether his intention was good or bad or to get ratings or whatever, I want to have this conversation with someone that disagrees with me or thinks otherwise, and um, of course. I promised Bryce I'd go on his podcast first, and you guys knew that when I DM when you guys DM me, and you guys were second. You guys were next, next to one of my best friends in the world. Mm -hmm. Russell just, um, you know, we scheduled it for today. Russell wanted to have a Survivor podcast with me. Two hours before we had it, he called me and said, "Hey, Wendell, all day I've been I saw a picture, and all day I have been pondering this and thinking about this." And I want to talk about the issues in America today. And I heard it in his voice. And I said, Russell, save it. Save it for tonight when we podcast. I'm with you. One way or another, we'll talk it through. I don't, I'm not scared of you saying the wrong thing. You shouldn't be scared of you saying the wrong thing. Um, yeah, there were some things that people said, oh, Russell shouldn't have said that or this. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, maybe, maybe he didn't know. Maybe he was not not privy or ignorant to the fact that all right that might be a hot button that whatever but at the end of the day we had that conversation we're trying to break down walls and um there were a couple when he called me he said wendell it would be important if we could maybe get this survivor or that survivor on other survivors that i asked could have been because it was two hours before the podcast but some survivors that i asked said no hell no no way i'm not going on a podcast with russell hance Despite that, um, another important call I made was Dom. And he also, he was just like, hey, Wendell, you will be able to do this. You can handle it. Do your thing. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm scared when I use my words as well, but I'm going to speak out and you're, you're going to be fine with Russell. And despite the fact that I didn't have some survivors on the podcast to have that conversation, I'm not... I can't, I can't, I'm not in a position where I can back down from having a conversation with Russell Hans, someone that people have told me he said crazy things about President Obama and other things. If I can show him my standpoint, maybe change his perspective, which it has changed, um, and also communicate with his viewers and let them know that this issue happens to people like oh wendell one survivor and he's a very happy and social person this still plagues me this hurts me i still think at any point when i get pulled over because it happens so much that officer doesn't know me as wendell from survivor and these things can happen to me so i'm not scared of having these conversations i appreciate people uh, especially you guys for giving me the platform to speak on it i appreciate russell for giving me the platform to speak on it but these are conversations that we um, as a community, as a country, we can't be scared to have these conversations if we have the right thing in here. We can't be scared. We can't. We can't. Like, we can't. I'll have these conversations. I don't know. I don't know what might happen to me out in the streets or whatever, but I will still fight for what I think is right, for sure. Wendell, I never, kind of like what, what Kellen had said, I, I don't know 
what the right thing to say is. And I've always been so scared to say something for that exact reason. And I actually wanted to end this by asking you how we and how everyone who's listening and, and anybody who does listen to this, how we can help. And it sounds, it sounds like that's it. It's just putting yourself out there, having these conversations. And even though I probably will say the wrong thing and so many people will, and even if that means disagreeing, I think just, just being candid about it is, is really important. So, so thank you. It's also a matter of um, a couple little quick tidbits to those white folks that want to speak out that might think that what they're saying is, is, is not the right thing to say. Don't talk about your black friend. Don't say, I don't see color. Um, if you say, if, if you say, I don't see color, then that says that you don't, you don't see me and what I have, what I have to live through the lens that I see through. I want, I want you to understand me for, all my different or, or view me and view that I'm different and I've had a different plight. And I've had, um, I've, the, the things that affect me might affect you differently, you know? So don't say, I don't see color. Don't say, talk mm -hmm. about your black friend. Um, but just try to, um, try to put yourself in, in the position of someone else. Um, but again, know, know that speaking out and not just sending a text, speaking out is great. Know that um, in like in closed circles, when when there are no black people around or minorities around, the things that you say matter, and the things that other people say, you can stand on your morals and say something and speak out. Um, what else? It's it's about it's about doing things when no one's watching, and it's about showing those that are affected that you're willing to take the extra step with them. So, um, yeah. and knowing that you will, you may lose friends, you may get backlash. Don't respond to the backlash or the people that aren't allied. Like you're, you're doing it because you're actively fighting against the system that was made to keep a class back. And that's not how the country should work. So you're doing it to make, the country better because as if everyone gets better, everyone gets better. And as we hold people back because of the many things in unequal access to everything um, or whatever, because of like housing discrimination, because of the prison industrial complex, because of whatever, um, any, because of all these things, there's a group of people that have now reached a bubbling point. And we need to listen to their concerns. That's all I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. So Alexa, thank you very much for. <laughs> we heard it. <laughs> I only talk to her every morning asking her what the temperature is. But um, yeah. She's but happy thank you thanked her now. <laughs> thank you, but, but thank you because I, if I were to put myself in your shoes, I might be a little intimidated and not necessarily know how to say what I say, because I'm scared that I might offend someone. Think about what you're saying. Think about what you want to say. Put yourself in someone else's uh, shoes and uh, just put it out there from the heart. Yep. Knew well, that. Thanks. Wendell, Bob. this this podcast was absolutely amazing. Loved every second of it. I mean, I think we've had you on two or three times. This was my favorite one by far with you. Um, we now have to do the promote ourselves at the end of the podcast which feels gross after all yeah, of that I but it's I'm like just say, you guys know how to find us on social media we're gonna do something really cool monday night um with one that's what i got um, yeah wendell i i hope you and bryce have a fantastic picnic tomorrow i think that is extremely well deserved um and again thank you for coming on this was this was what we wanted to talk about and um you know i, I hope a lot of people take a lot from this thank you guys so much I appreciate you guys.